Welcome to Disaffected. I'm Joshua Slocum, and this is the show where we talk about politics, culture, and relationships through a psychological lens. And I want to start out with some listener mail this week. This one comes from Adam. Adam says, Earlier this week, I experienced the authoritarian dining rules firsthand. I was heading home and decided to pop into A&W for a burger and a root beer. I wore my muzzle like a good boy, paid with my debit card, and proceeded to take my grub to one of the tables. She then asked for proof of vax. Unbelievable. I said, I don't have one. She immediately started with, well, you need proof of a vaccine to eat in here. I'm going to cut away from this for a second. (laughs) You don't need proof of a vaccine to order the food, but you need proof of a vaccine to take it over to a table and sit down. Back to Adam. Everybody was staring at me. The dehumanizing tone and prompt proclivity to enforce the rules angered me. My own mother is fully plugged into the narrative. I've had the guilt trip a number of times about not getting the COVID jab. Despite the fact that both vaccinated and unvaccinated people can catch and spread the disease, she maintains her position on it. I don't generally find it difficult to cope with everything that's going on, but this week has caused my spirits to drop a bit. The authoritarian bastards and experts on television are even advising us not to visit people on Canadian Thanksgiving or limit the amount of folks with whom we come into contact, as if we need their permission. These same anointed luminaries who attend galas and sophisticated parties in a wild, mask-free abandon. Their sheer brazen contempt for ordinary people is glaringly obvious, and yet most will feign ignorance and remain oblivious. I hear you, Adam. I see the same thing every day. None of this makes any sense. But people, as you say, are really plugged into the narrative. They really, really don't want to let it go. And they're plugged into the same narratives about other things, too. And once again, we have to talk about trans because it isn't really about trans, is it? It's about control. It's about where our society is going. It's about who is the arbiter of cultural rules and who gets to enforce them. Trans is just a vehicle for the current authoritarian impulse. And we've all worried about speaking candidly about our political opinions, about our cultural opinions. We've been talking about what we used to call political correctness for 30 years now used to be only the right wing ever mentioned this, and people like me who were on the left believed that this was just a right wing boogeyman. Political correctness was, well, that's just being respectful to people. It's just being polite to people. I used to say these things and I used to believe them. I wish it hadn't taken me so long to see what these people were trying to say, but I was infected with that idea as, who, who said this to me this week? Somebody said to me, it seems like we've gotten to a place where voting for the Republicans or voting for a conservative is seen by almost every liberal as itself a moral failing, not a disagreement of policy, not a disagreement of priorities, but an actual moral failing. Well, it does seem that way. And it honestly, it seemed that way to me when I was on the left. Thanks for that, Adam. I'm sorry to hear this is going on, but misery does love company. And it does buoy me a little bit that other people see it. So how does trans rear its head this week? Well, how does it not? All of you have probably heard about comic Dave Chappelle's new special called The Closer. I have not watched it. I've seen clips of it, but I have not watched it start to finish, so I don't have a full opinion on his set. But we all know who's angry about it and what they're angry about. Because Chappelle told the truth about trans activism and said things like, these people will make up words to get you in trouble. And yes, they will, and they do. And boy, did that send them into orbit this week really upset them. They do not like the truth being told. So some employees at Netflix, which is the network that is 
you say, um, it's not quite publishing, is it? Because it's not written. The, ne- uh, the network carrying um, Chappelle's special. Some employees decided that they had been discriminated against and harmed by Chappelle's jokes, so they decided to stage a protest in a walkout outside of Netflix's headquarters. And <laughs> you're probably going to guess what I think about this, but this was such a good example of some of the psychological abuse dynamics on this show that I couldn't resist it. Kevin, can we roll that first clip, please, of the protest? Unbelievable. <laughs> oh, do you want me to drop my weapon? Yes. Okay. Get and leave. There's my weapon. We're not to to I'm not discussing anything. I'm just here to say that jokes are funny, people. Dave Chappelle is a funny guy. Okay, so much going on there. So for those of you listening who couldn't see this, this is outside of Netflix's headquarters, and there's a man there who is carrying a sign on a stick that says, We like Dave. That's all it says. We like Dave. So he's a counter-protester. So a bunch of these wackadoodles, all carrying their stonewall and transcolor signs, go up to the guy, and one big man comes over to him, grabs his sign, rips it off the stick he was holding it on, puts it on the ground, and starts stamping on it. As soon as this guy ripped this other man's sign down and started stamping on it, they, they ripped it off the wooden uh, dowel that he was holding the sign on. So the guy takes his wooden dowel and backs up, and then the crowd starts saying, he's got a weapon, he's got a weapon. It's unfucking believable. He's got a weapon. And then a young woman who looks like maybe a 24-year-old lesbian. Oh, excuse me. It's probably a a trans man. Who the hell knows? Tiny little thing, might weigh 100 pounds soaking wet. She walks up to the guy whose sign was ripped down, and he's a big guy. He's a big portly guy. She stands a head shorter than him, and she's got her arms out as if she's blocking him and she's pushing her chest up to him like she's going to stand in the way of him doing a violence on people. It's the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. She's lucky that man has self-control and and can keep his temper because she wouldn't have come out of that the hero that she thinks she is. It's play acting. She's acting like she's big and tough. She's stopping this guy who's got a sign that says, we like Dave, and she's going to stand there with her hands out and be a physical barrier. It's freaking ridiculous. Then, at the same time, another woman has a couple, they look like actual drumsticks, and she's waving them in his face, and she's screaming, repent, motherfucker, repent, motherfucker. And she's literally screaming it, if you can hear her. It looks to me like religious delirium, actual religious delirium. This was the best example I've seen in a long time of a dynamic I've discussed before, and it's abbreviated by its initials, and that dynamic is called DARVO. That stands for Deny, Attack, Reverse, Victim, and Offender. It is a an initialism and an abbreviation that is used to describe a very typical tactic of abusive people. 
often people with cluster B personality disorders. They initiate force against somebody else, but then they claim force was initiated against them. They deny that they did anything wrong. They put themselves in the victim position, even when they are the aggressor. And it works on people. It worked on everybody standing there who was part of the, the larger part of that crowd who was there to protest Dave Chappelle. So again, DARVO, deny, at attack, reverse victim and offender. Well, we've got more from this. Uh, there were some journalistic outlets there who wanted to interview some of the protesters to see what they were on about. Hmm. Take a listen to this. This guy is is uh, in drag here. I'm a non-binary individual. I also go by the persona of Eureka O'Hara, which has been debuted on RuPaul's Drag Race, uh, Season 9, 10, All-Star 6, and HBO's We're Here. David, D-A-V-I-D-H-U-G-G-A-R-D, and then Eureka, E-U-R-E-K-A-O-H-A-R-A. -A Amazing. So, I mean, first thing, like, why is it so important to be out here today? Yeah, I know it's important to be out here today because we have to stand in solidarity with each other. Obviously, uh, Ashley Marie Preston is a, a great advocate and a huge sister of mine, um, also a trans woman. As a non-binary person, we as trans people and non-binary people aren't getting visibility or respect in the entertainment industry to begin with. And to have something like Dave Chappelle's special not be noted that it's, it's promoting discrimination and hate conversation is very um, hurtful to the activism and the cause that we're trying to progress ourselves in the industry. What do you think, I mean, like, there are counter-protesters here. I mean, like, what do you think of that? The counter-protesters are disheartening, and it's sad to see that um, they are using the expression of laughing um, in the faces of people's pain and hurt and suffering. And I don't think that they understand what they're doing, but they are promoting and causing hate conversation and also allowing people to think that it's okay to discriminate against those trans and non-binary individuals. I was also um, misgendered, disrespected by some of them, and it just shows that we are still working on growth. And um, it's, it's my duty as a person not of color and as a non-binary individual to stand by specifically my trans brothers and sisters and everything in between of color as a white person with privilege because they need to know that there are people standing beside them when the people that, that are at the table in those powerful, responsible positions aren't showing that support. You know, when I first heard that, I did a double take because... Is that me doing the voice? Because <laughs> it sounds like it. <laughs> These people are a parody of themselves. This man, just to give you a visual, if you're not be, if you're not seeing this, this man he looks to be very tall. He looks to be well over six foot tall. He's morbidly obese. He's wearing some kind of a moo moo. And he's got his head shaved except for a top lock on top, which is dyed lavender. It's. I, I, it, <laughs> and that kind of that kind of patter that he's giving there, that kind of canned. Stilted. Conversational patter. This is what people who aren't very smart sound like when they're trying to sound smart and cosmopolitan and erudite. They don't actually have very sophisticated ideas. They don't think about things very deeply. But they want to sound like they do, so they just load up on the jargon and the buzzwords. You're so concerned with identity. Yeah, I'm a drag performer, and my character, Eureka, which has been debuted on HBO, and blah, 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 and blah, 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 and RuPaul's Drag Race. Well, it's obvious why you didn't win, isn't it? Because you're not that good. You're just annoying. <laughs> Dave Chappelle is promoting hate conversations. We're, we're past hate speech now. Now we've got whole hate conversations. <laughs> so silly. And he's ignoring people's hurt and pain 
and suffering. Are you kidding me? A comedy special is causing hurt and pain and suffering. These people haven't had a painful day in their lives, if that's what they think pain is. <sighs> and we give into it. We flatter it. We take it seriously. We don't laugh at it. We should be laughing at, at this. I know some people don't like that. But we should be laughing at this because it's ridiculous and it's treating us like we're all stupid. This is not how grown-ups act. This is how children act. Children and, and people who are emotionally children. It's not our responsibility to try to re-raise them. It's not our responsibility to make allowances for their emotional immaturity and just be understanding with them. That's how they got this way and that's why they're staying this way because we have no boundaries. It's ridiculous. <clears throat> well, you think that's ridiculous? Wait until you hear about what happened at Oberlin College. <laughs> $80,000 a year, Oberlin College. Let's put up a picture here of the complainant, in this case, from Oberlin College. This is a, uh, a young man named Peter Frey Witzer. And it isn't a young man. It's a young woman. Actually, it looks like a Harry Potter tribute act. If you're, not, if you're not watching the video, this young woman looks like Daniel Radcliffe in Harry Potter, as so many of them do. Have you noticed that? Why do so many of them try to be a boy as Harry Potter? Is it the magic? The fantasy? Is it the non-threatening male image that they want? I'm not sure, but there's a lot of them out there who look just like this. Well, so what is Peter upset about? According to the New York Post, a student at Ohio's $80,000 a year Oberlin College said he was left feeling angry and scared after the school allowed cisgender male workers to install radiators in a dormitory dedicated to women and transgender students. Angry and scared. I know we're looking at somebody who looks like she's trying to be a 12-year-old boy, but this is actually an adult. As a reminder, when you're in college, you're actually a legal adult. Okay? Don't let your sympathy lobe get tugged on by somebody presenting this image of a, well, allegedly a little boy, but a little girl, right? Grown-up. This is a grown-up who lives in a dormitory dedicated to women and transgender students who was upset that cisgender men, that is, just regular old men who don't say they have a gender identity problem, were called in to install radiators. Here's an extended quotation. I was angry, scared, and confused. Why didn't the college complete the installation over the summer when the building was empty? Why couldn't they tell us precisely when the workers would be there? Why were they only notifying us the day before the installation was due to begin? In general, I am very averse to people entering my personal space. The anxiety was compounded by the fact that the crew would be strangers and they were more than likely to be cisgender men. Bitch, you're trying to tell everybody you're a man. That's you. You changed your name to Peter, or you browbeat everybody into pretending your name is Peter and pretending that they think you're a boy or a man. And you're actually complaining that men are going to come in and install, install a radiator. You're angry, scared, and confused. Get to a goddamn therapist. Jesus. You know, I mean, I can make some educated guesses about this young woman. She may be, I know a lot of people say they're not angry and scared. They're, they're just doing it for attention. I don't think it's that clear cut. Yeah, they are doing it for attention because doing these things for attention is one of the maladaptive ways that people like this have been badly trained by their upbringing to feel good about themselves. Negative attention is, 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 
useful to them as positive attention. They don't know how to validate themselves because this, this is trauma. It's obnoxious. It's narcissistic. It looks like it's in the neighborhood of cluster B. Yeah, it does. But that doesn't come from nowhere. So I am willing to bet that this young woman really does have an anxiety disorder. She probably does suffer from panic attacks frequently. She probably really does get worked up over this stuff. But I'm also willing to bet, but that doesn't matter. It, it, it does not matter if that's true for her. That doesn't make the normal, ordinary actions of the rest of the world something that they need to stop on account of her. Nothing can work that way. She needs help to deal with her problems. And she and and the, how many thousands of other young people like her not only are not getting that help, but they're not even being prompted or nudged to get that help because they're being indulged by their college. They're being indulged by the culture. A little bit more from that article. Quote, when the work crew showed up on October 8th to install the new radiators, Fr Frey Witzer said he asked if he could be exempt from having one installed in his room, but was denied the request. So you're going to go the whole winter in Ohio without a radiator in your room? Really? Because you're afraid a man will be in there? Come on. Frey Witzer said he was mildly violated, for Christ's sake, and angry when the workers returned the following day to check the radiators were actually working. Oh, my goodness. Do you know what I would give for a contractor who was that conscientious? When you start paying your own bills, you'll learn to appreciate that level of professionalism, I hope. <laughs> and, and one more, and I'll close this out. The student said only women and trans students are permitted to live on the second and third floors of the Baldwin Cottage dormitory. But I thought you're a man. The other thing that's so ridiculous about this, this is the most prototypical young neurotic female response ever. Ever. This is exactly like an over-anxious adolescent girl. That's not a criticism of girls. It's just very typical of the emotional incontinence that is very common to adolescents, particularly female adolescents. And yet, we're all supposed to pretend that we think Peter is Peter? This is not going to end well. It's not going to end well for her. It's not going to end well for us. Because it doesn't just stay in college. You've been told that by people? Oh, you're worried over nothing. This is just some kooky college students. Or this is just liberal colleges. They're always full of nonsense. These people will get a real check when they come into the real world. Don't you worry. Stop complaining about the millennials. Stop complaining about the Zoomers. Nobody's going to tolerate that when they get real jobs. Oh, yeah, they will. They'll not only tolerate it, they'll promote it to admiral. Next topic. <clears throat> Headline. Rachel Levine becomes first openly transgender four-star officer across uniform services. Rachel Levine is a man whose original name was Richard, who transitioned and was the former Secretary of Health for Pennsylvania. You may remember Levine being criticized over getting his mother out of a nursing home while he was sending other nursing home patients back with COVID. That's when I first heard of Levine. And those of you who can't see this, this is a man in his 60s, an obvious man, a portly man in his 60s who's grown his hair out and puts on lipstick and female clothing and calls himself Rachel. I have no idea what his transition actually meant. I don't know if he had any surgery or not, and I don't care because it doesn't matter. He's still a man. And yet the respectable news, this is funny. 
first openly transgender four-star officer. They're aping what they used to say about gay people, first openly gay senator, first openly gay commissioner. That made sense in that context because although many of us gay people do give off clues through our behavior and our mannerisms, you can't automatically tell someone's gay simply by looking at them. They want to act like transgenderism is just the same thing. It's just another way of being like gay. First, openly transgender. Like nobody would have known. Nobody can see the man standing in front of them calling themselves Rachel. Oh, you can't know if they're transgender unless you ask them their gender identity. Yeah, right. Sure, Jan. It's such deception. Such deception. Well, let's take a look at the next image. <laughs> This is a tweet from the U.S. Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy. And it's a picture of him standing there while Rachel Levine takes an oath of office with a hand raised and another hand on a Bible. And here, here's what our Surgeon General, our Surgeon General, wrote in the tweet. It was an honor to witness Admiral Levine's historic appointment as the first female four-star officer to serve in the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps and the first openly transgender four-star officer to serve in any of the uniformed services. Did you catch that? First female four-star officer? Cast your mind back a couple of years. Remember some of the arguments you had with people who couldn't understand why you were so upset about those poor trans people well, if they want to be called women, why can't you just call them women? It's just a little thing. Just, just treat them as honorary women. Just use the words. Use the words they want you to. That'll satisfy them. And people like, well, radical feminists have been the loudest about this. They've been screaming this longer than anybody has. And they're right. And they say, it's not going to stop with the word woman. It's going to be female. They're going to erase the fact that sex actually exists, and that is exactly what has happened. You can't give abusive, exploitative, and grasping people an inch because they will take a mile every single time. Woman was never going to be enough for them. This was always going to happen. It's just gender identity. Really? Then why, why is the Surgeon General describing Richard Levine as a female? the first female four-star officer. Why? Do you know what female means? It means female, doesn't it? Biologically female. This is where we're at. You know, sometimes I wish I could talk to a few of the people who tore, who just tore into me over the past five or six years, telling me I was crazy. I was mean. I was exaggerating. I was being histrionic. Why can't you just be nice? This is why. But you know what? It wouldn't do any good to talk to those people because they wouldn't admit that they ever said it. Of all the people, all the friends, the former friends, all the people that I used to hang around with online, people I used to go to conferences with, all of them, and there were so many, who called me a bigot, an exaggerator, a rabble rouser, said I was out of line, over-egging, everything making it seem worse than it was. Out of all of those people, one of them apologized to me once. I've received one acknowledgement and apology, and it was a private message on Twitter I got about three years ago. I was glad she said it. I was appreciative of it. But she wouldn't even say it in public. Let me, <laughs> just to really drive the point home on this one, let's put up Levine's official portrait on the screen. That's a man, baby. That's your first female four-star officer. <laughs> Ridiculous. Coming up on a break, 
See you after the break, folks, and we've got a special guest, so do come back. For more conversation on the dark and disordered psychology that shapes today's cultural and political left, subscribe to our weekly audio podcast on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Google Podcasts, and virtually anywhere else you get your podcasts. Let's learn to recognize these dynamics and call them what they are. Subscribe to Disaffected to learn how to break the spell. We now have a bonus for our supporters. You can help the Disaffected podcast grow and receive invitations for our off-air Zoom hangouts by becoming a supporting member on Patreon or Subscribestar. Patreon users, go to patreon.com slash disaffected. Subscribestar users, you can find us at subscribestar.com slash disaffected. Check out our webpage at disaffected.fm for the complete list of ways you can help support us. And thank you. So since we spend so much time on this show making fun of other people, I thought Turnabout is fair play. And it's it's time to um, it's time to make fun of myself and one of my friends. So we talked a lot on the show about the warped values of of gay male culture and today what has become LGBTQ plus culture. And it is true that being gay or as they say now, being queer, which of course I don't think applies to me, um, has gotten really all about uh, glibness, superficiality, narcissism. That's true, but these things were always there. And in a sense, gay male culture has always been about an excess of sexuality, an excess of look-at-me behavior. That was certainly true uh, decades ago when I was coming out of the closet. Um, So to talk about this, we're going to bring back... um, a very good friend of mine, nobody better to break this down with, um, but this friend. And she is a truly great lady. She's both my sister and my daughter. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss George Zamarippa. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Welcome, darling. You wouldn't hurt a fly. <laughs> oh really did she like it yeah she liked it <laughs> exactly <laughs> oh thank you josh for having me on the show again and i can't wait to well, talk shit about each other <laughs> well you've come to the right place so when we were getting ready for the show, I asked you to get together some photographs of you um, being a young homosexual, and I did the same myself. Um, so I figured we could look at those, we could make fun of each other, and you know maybe talk a little bit about what it seemed like back in the 80s and the 90s when this was all fresh and new to us. Sure. What do you think, George, about... What do you think about the idea that gay male culture has always been narcissistic, histrionic, um, over the top, that those values are sort of baked in. That's the way I see it. How do you see it? I, I think you're, I think you're right. Um, you know, I think it's, I think it's gotten, I think it's gotten worse, um, within the last 10, 15 years as, which is funny because that's, you know, we've gotten so many rights, you know, federally within the, you know, in such a short amount of time. And we've been, you know, gay marriage and really that's sort of the the pinnacle. Although the queer community likes to say that, you know, that's not, you know, the the pinnacle of, um, of, of rights. But, um, you know, it, it really, I think it's gotten, it's gotten, Mark markedly worse, like with a really short amount of time, and it's probably due to our social media culture, 
and everybody, you know, instead of being a real person, treating themselves as a brand. Um, yes. That's probably why it's sort of like shot up so much at least. But I absolutely agree that narcissism, you know, you know, uh, another term you could use, I mean, people throw the term vanity around, you know, gay men are extremely vain. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, as a gay man, you know, absolutely. I, <laughs> I, I, I like to think I still have my looks. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but, um, you're yeah. like, you're like, you're like looking down at the little price tag on you that has the sell by date and erasing it and writing in a new one in the future. <laughs> yeah. Consume by. <laughs> freshest buy exactly freshest exactly <laughs> and then there's a little flap that you lift up like the back of the bacon it's like you know representative slice <laughs> slice <laughs> except when I pull mine back it's all just that white congealed fat <laughs> <laughs> just put it back just like mm. right, exactly. don't look at it <laughs> it's nothing <laughs> yeah they they throw you back into the <laughs> throw you back into the refrigerated <laughs> section <laughs> back in the discount corner <laughs> um no i think it's uh, sorry to sort of go back to that question but i think that it's it's um i think it's always been there i you know um we're and I don't think it's it's I don't think I'm going overboard to say that the general gay male is the culture is obsessed, that's the word, obsessed with youth, with um almost unattainable beauty standards. Um yeah. and it's a lot, I've always I know when I was at Sarah Lawrence, I remember having a conversation in one of my psychology classes about the similarities between um, what, you know, the, the types of um, ideal females that were being presented to young girls and saying, but this happens in the gay community as well. And I remember there was a young heterosexual man in, in class and I didn't say young gay men, I said men. Um, that men have these these um, beauty ideals as well, and he was just like, "What are you talking about? I don't see that." Blah blah blah. And I was like, "Have you picked up a men's health magazine? I mean, walking by the 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 stand, you should uh, a newsstand, you should be able to see this. I mean, this is not difficult, <laughs> right?" And um, I I do think that it does. I mean, I, he may have had a point that heterosexual men maybe not or may not may not be as attuned to it or as again obsessed with it but it's definitely there and it's been there for a long time and it still exists again i think it's worse now yeah i agree and i do think it's true that that heterosexual men are not as attuned to it not as concerned with it um i trying to figure out why gay men go so far in that direction I'm not entirely sure, but, you know, coming out in my teenage years, and I think this is true for most young gay men, it becomes very quickly apparent what our, what our population, what our tribe puts a premium on, mm. right? Beauty, youth, um, the, at least the appearance of physical fitness, being the party boy, you know, being up for anything, stay up all night, close the bars, this, that, and the other thing. Um, mm -hmm. And it's certainly, you know, it's certainly attractive and exciting to a young person. Let's um, let's get into some of our young people pictures okay. and show them how we did it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> oh so, all right. So we have the first one. What year is this, George? For those of you listening. George is standing there looking up like he's looking up at an angel in the sky and he's got a long black leather trench coat on with jeans and a vest 
and what is that a peace symbol you're wearing on a on a chain around your neck it's a peace symbol <laughs> okay did it work <laughs> Well, if you ask politely, I might give you a piece. Does that make? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, thank you. I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, no, least, I'm not. At least you're not a vegan. Uh, That's all I would say. To that. <laughs> oh yeah, don't let's do that for another show. Yeah. What year is this? I what actually am not. I think it's probably ninety three. I'm going to say it's probably oh, really? 93, okay. 94. Um, it's definitely after my uh, oldest brother, uh, Jay, had um, had died of uh, HIV-related illness. Um, okay. Because that jacket was his. Um, and my mother gave ah. that. Yeah, and my mother gave that to me. And so that was right after, yeah, that was right after he had, he had um, died. And... Um, that was right around actually his death was actually the the um kind of the push for me to um come out of the closet um okay and so yeah so i i loved that jacket and you know my my brother was kind of this um mythical sort of or lack of a better term creature to me because he lived in new york city he had a thriving business he you know through wonderful parties and, and was friends with, you know, really sort of wealthy people, uh, you know, be, through his business and, you know, he had great clothes and, and, you know, I just sort of everything that he could sort of, uh, he stood for, I just, I wanted. And so, um, uh, you know, anything that came from him, and I still have a lot of his stuff. It's just, you know, uh, it's one of those things not to, I know we're supposed to be making fun of ourselves, but there's something a little no, sweet. It's, it's both and. There's something a little sweet here about this is that, you know, um, now that I'm older, I I really wish I would have been able to have an adult relationship with my, with my adult older gay sibling that, you know, unfortunately, you know, HIV robbed so many of us uh, from having relationships with friends and loved ones. But, but I have to say, I don't know what my thing was with those, with those like peace signs. I had an onk that I wore. I had all these things that like- It was a big thing in the early nineties. It was, and I think it was probably, it was probably, I was really into rave culture at this time too, because I really loved like techno and stuff. So that might've been, mm -hmm. might've been part of it. So there were all of these sort of things I was into kind of clashing at the same time. So it was like, oh, I like fashion, but I like rave, but I like some sort of, you know, and, uh, you know, there, there were just things that I was just like, I'll just throw all these things together and make it work. <laughs> and that, if you notice my hair's long there, that was yep. a couple of years after, um, uh, Blonde Ambition and Truth or Dare had come out and I was obsessed with Slam, her backup dancer. Yes. And so yes. I was growing, I grew my hair out long because I wanted, I wanted, I loved his hair. But of course it wasn't going to be like his because I don't have wavy hair. I have straight hair. And so, yep, you know, know, it's just very like, you know, sort of whatever. But that was kind of right around the time that it was really kind of growing in longer. <laughs> and of course I was looking up posing like that because I, I was just such a, drama queen <laughs> you know everything everything yeah. was a stage <laughs> <I know. laughs> let's have more oh here we go oh. <laughs> speaking of drama queen this is 1980 this is me in 1989 at my first gay pride parade it was the 20th anniversary of the original um stonewall uh stonewall in 1969 that was ralph um, my ad hoc boyfriend, he was sweet. He later died of AIDS. Um, and I was, when I was looking at this the other night, I put it out on Twitter and then I deleted it. And I thought to myself, you know, it's, it's performative and flamboyant behavior. You know, it's not something I would do now, but I was 15 years old and, and it, you know, 
it seemed really exciting to be seen kissing in public with another man, you know, or another boy, actually. Um, and, it, you know, I think that's part of the allure or part of the reason why so many young gay men just become so overt about their sexuality. There is something to the idea that if you have to suppress it and if it's not accepted by society and it can't be expressed in a normative, uncontroversial way, that it sort of gets pent up and you and it all sort of overflows. But and I think there is something to that, but mm -hmm. I also think it's it's sort of self-reinforcing, and I think that we, collectively, gay people, gay men anyway, have always gone overboard uh, with this, and it, it's sort of a positive feedback loop. So I think we create a lot of it ourselves, too, anyway. I absolutely agree. I think what you just explained is right on right on the nose. Um, yeah, absolutely. I It's funny, I was having a conversation with my mom yesterday, somewhat related, and I was, I was, I had mentioned to her that, um, uh, a lot of these things, you know, like this picture and what you're talking about, I was going to, I was just about to say to you that at that time it was exciting because it was exciting. Nobody was doing that. And if they were, you know, it, this was an act at that time, you know, not to sound like my, you know, uh, like queers, but an act of rebellion and, you know, um, mm. in a way. And so, and this was, uh, a, a cultural sort of coming out at that time when, yeah. you know, and so I don't fault, I don't fault that. I, you know, if you look at young heterosexual teenagers, I mean, to me, this is akin to, you know, coming home with hickeys all over your neck. You're trying to prove, <laughs> yeah. no, really. I mean, you're, I mean, you're, yeah. you're trying to prove a point, right. Um, that, yeah. you know, I, you know, I am now a sexual you know, person and, and, and look at me, I'm doing this, I'm getting some, what you going to do about yep. it, mom? <laughs> exactly. You know, but, um, all right. Anyway, let's, let's roll more of them. Let's, let's, let's see more of our, okay. So uh, <laughs> I love this. Where is this George? So this is, I went to boarding school. Um, uh, I'm from Colorado and I went to boarding school, uh, close to my hometown. Um, and I lived on campus and every year they have this, uh, this uh, where I went to school, they had this thing called um, Stupid Night Out. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> okay. and it was just a, it was like a kind of a talent show uh, thing where um, students could submit just like funny things just to be kind of silly. It was a, it was an opportunity to be silly. And it was a whole weekend actually, where you did like, tricycle races and like just really <laughs> silly stuff um which looking back on it now I'm like that's actually kind of cool because it, it it's yeah you know don't take life so seriously kind of a thing and this I got a bunch of my a couple of my friends and some several of the faculty members to do to to do a um basically to lip sync I'm too sexy which was really popular at that time I was gonna say yeah the expression on your face is very look how I'm a strut yes exactly and so we were I, we were strutting down the catwalk there um uh to I'm too sexy and it was just really funny because we had like our French teacher our Spanish teacher like we had all mm -hmm. these people doing it with us and it was just it was just really 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 fun but that was such a I, that was such a thing for me at that time was just kind of, I was really kind of in people's faces when I was in high school. You know, I, um, yeah. <laughs> I did not, I didn't care. I was really like, oh yeah, you don't like this. Oh, I'm just going to do it even more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I identify with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's up next, Kevin? <laughs> Give us another picture. Oh, here we go. Oh, this hair. <laughs> this hair. That hair. The hair. <laughs> Excuse me. So this is this is me at 16 years old being interviewed in the local newspaper uh, when I was starting to become a gay rights activist as a teenager, way too young. <laughs> and uh, yes, 
Yes, everyone. Um, Madonna has always been the cluster B that I cannot quit. Mm -hmm. So I've been Absolutely. like this for a lo long, long time. <laughs> <laughs> you see that in the... Um, <laughs> God, it was such an angry, bitchy young man. <laughs> the, the, the title here says school struggles with homosexuality. No, I think I'm struggling with homosexuality. <laughs> that looks like I'm struggling. <laughs> oh, I, mostly your hair was struggling with homosexuality. Yeah, you, <laughs> I know. It's a bleach blonde mushroom. <laughs> but that was so popular back then. I mean, I, yeah, I, know. I do I have know. to say about this, your eyebrows are on fleek. <laughs> I think I was going a little heavy on the pencil. What do you think? <laughs> oh, we could go to, if we had photos of me at Sarah Lawrence, you want to talk about going heavy on the pencil? No. We're <laughs> All right. Let's get that off the screen. That's enough of that. What do we have next? Oh, okay. Oh, look at you. You're so cute. If anyone's wondering, I'm on the right. <laughs> Oh, they, they totally couldn't tell you're the gay one by the way you're standing. I know, right? <laughs> so this is actually a, um, a really, okay, for, okay, first of all, we have to talk about, yes, my mother went through a mauve or mauve or however you say it, um, mm -hmm. phase, as you can see by the carpet there, the wall-to-wall -wall mauve carpet on the floor. <laughs> but um, these are actually my, my brothers. Um, uh, my, the brother in the middle is my brother, Jay. Um, he's the one who... Um, uh, died um, way too young. He was uh, 33, actually, when he passed away. I hate that term, sorry. <laughs> um, and then that's my brother Bill on the left in the, the red sweater. I think, he, I think my brother was either on his way or had just come back from military. Um, yep. But yeah, I'm like 13. Yeah, like 12 or 13 in this photo. And oh yeah, I was, I, yeah. I was very much. You're already. You're already a little special. Oh yeah, the you know the. I was a little. I was still. I was just trying to find my way out of that dorky phase, that queen dorky phase. Yeah. Because you can tell by the big glasses. Like I hadn't. I hadn't convinced my parents to get me contact lenses yet. <laughs> <laughs> you vain little thing. I know. I know. But you know that's that's what it was. But you know this is actually a really. Um, uh, this is, I think my brothers and sisters would all say this is probably one of their favorite photos because it's one of the only photos of all three of the brothers together because yeah. my brother Jay lived in New York City, so he didn't come visit us very often. But um, right. yeah, I, uh, I, <laughs> it's funny. I think those, those pants I'm wearing in that are, are actually back in right now. I think you'd see a lot of Gen Z. The acid wash. Gen yes. Z's wearing those, uh, you know, probably look at that and be like, oh, I love those pants. <laughs> is that z cavarici it probably was probably was they probably well, went all the way up to my nipples and then folded down four times <laughs> <in my nipples. laughs> all right let's let's roll through quickly the rest of these um because i want to get to a fun exercise you and i are going to help people understand something about 70s commercials yes. so uh yeah this is 16 this is me in high school being Madonna between classes. And I am wearing, what are you wearing? Chess King, because oh. I worked at Chess King. I didn't shop at Chess King. <laughs> I didn't shop at Chess King. Where did you shop? Merry-Go-Round? I loved Merry-Go-Round. I loved Chess King. <laughs> um, what was that other one? Oak Tree? Oak Tree. Oak yes. Tree was another one. <laughs> um. Oh my gosh. They clicked to the next oh. photo. <laughs> so here we are. This is, <laughs> good Lord. <laughs> I, <can't... laughs> I know. <laughs> so I try to squeeze myself into that bustier. Oh, okay. <laughs> squeeze. Okay. <laughs> I know. <laughs> to grease myself up to get up in that thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why does it smell like Kentucky Fried Chicken in here? <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm I'm feeling how crispy and delicious I am. <laughs> well, I I'm really really appreciative that um, 
I'm really appreciative that uh, Kevin, the producer, um, started with the full body shot just to make sure that everybody understood that this was a man because it's very <laughs> difficult, very difficult to tell once you get up close, you know? Oh yeah. <laughs> just, I mean, we're, you know, this is- this The illusion is, is flawless, isn't the it? The realness, the realness. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, I forgot to tell you. Sorry. Breaking news. I just got new um, license plates on my car and they say realness. <laughs> Do they really? <laughs> you freak. I love it. I love it. Georgie was taken. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You know what? Let's do this. Let's do this. This is been, yeah. Oh, don't make the people look at that anymore, Kevin. Oh, I love it. I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> I mean, as you're the one who taught, you're the one who's the first person to talk about, you know, uh, uh, trans wig lines. Let's talk about this wig line. Yeah, I know. Well, I, I just, I hadn't bleached my hair yet. Okay. After I bleached my hair, it was better. <laughs> is this the second leg of the better. tour when you stopped doing the, the ponytail? And you just yeah, I know because my hair was falling out. <laughs> that was the off. night after I lost my virginity in a phone booth. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I have a little treat here. I have been trying to explain to Kevin, I don't know why this is so difficult to understand, but I've been trying to explain to Kevin the absolute level of misanthropic, bitter hatred that the manicurist Madge in the Palmolive commercials held for all of her customers. Now, for those of you who are not of un certain age, like George and I are, Basically, men of our generation were raised on soap operas, reruns of Bewitched, and Paul Mollive commercials. Mm. So, <clears throat> excuse me, if you don't know, <clears throat> there was this long, it had to be 20 years, 25 years worth of commercials for Paul Mollive dish soap. And the same actress, Jan Minor, played uh, the manicurist, the wisecracking manicurist, Madge, uh, who was always telling women to come in and, and soak their nails in uh, Paul Mollive dishwashing liquid. Well, I went back and looked at some of these commercials again because, of course, it's been a long time since they've been on TV. And I didn't realize what an utter, complete bitch this woman is. <laughs> I mean, it is astonishing the level of simmering hatred just beneath the surface is, I, well, let's put it this way. It had to be a bitchy gay man who wrote the dialogue. Kevin, let's play the first Madge video. Okay. I just came from a rummage sale, Madge. Oh, I was wondering where you got these hands. Oh, it's dishwashing. <laughs> What'll I try? Everything. And use palm olive dishwashing liquid. It softens your hands while you do the dishes. You're soaking in it. In dishwashing liquid? <laughs> it's palm olive. Mild? Well, more than mild. Makes loads of suds at last. <laughs> and no kidding, palm olive softens hands while you do the dishes. Madge, mm -hmm. palm olive's as good as gold. I better get these to Fort Knox. <laughs> 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 such contempt for these women. I know. She, what'll I try? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> I got up to swap me. Mm, I can see you got those hands there too. I know. I just came from a rummage sale. <laughs> Look at your hands. You know, <laughs> that part where they go two weeks later and she comes back. Oh, no, no. See, this is how I would do it if I were doing these commercials. You're soaking in it. <laughs> Mild, more than mild. Then we'd cut away and there would be like a bottle of cyanide that nobody else can see. So then two weeks later, she'd come back just a walking skeleton. Madge, you were so right. <laughs> it took all those calluses right off my hands. You've never looked better. <laughs> but it would have to be one of those. Like but it, it can't be good CGI. It's got to be like really bad. Oh, yeah, terrible. Really bad, like a like and not see not CGI. I want the skeleton walking on visible wires. Yes, I want the wire. Yes, exactly. I want the <laughs> bad. Hey, this was really great. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to the next one. 
Oh, Madge, the hands fell off this clock. Ah, you should be so lucky. Oh, what will I try for these? Uh, try everything and use palm olive dishwashing liquid. It softens your hands while you do the dishes. You're soaking in it. Dishwashing liquid? <laughs> it's palm olive. Mild? More than mild. Makes heaps of suds that last. And like I said, palm olive softens hands while you do the dishes. Madge, I'm cuckoo over palm olive. <laughs> that makes two of you. <laughs> 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 you know what I like about it when she said you're soaking in it and she the woman starts to take her hand out and Madge is like no and she pushes her hand back down it's like she's trying to drown her fingers <laughs> no, but my favorite Madge part is, is gonna get you yeah no my favorite part is that she's like and like I said I mean that was <laughs> that was the that was literally the version of as my email stated below <laughs> I know <laughs> Holding that. <laughs> I know. Madge is coming in there and underlining her previous email. <laughs> what did you not understand? <laughs> no kidding. Softens your hands while you do the dishes. <laughs> yes, it's carbolic lie. <laughs> Let's go to the next one. <laughs> Madge, why did you decide to become a manicurist? All the usual reasons, romance, adventure, money, thirst for power. And when I see your hands, I wish I were a nurse. Dishwashing, Madge. Want to try palm olive dishwashing liquid? Softens your hands while you do the dishes. Pretty green. You're soaking in it. And dishwashing liquid? Palm olive. Mild, then. Oh, more than just mild. See how she pushes it back down? Right, Madge. Palm olive suds last from the first glass to the last greasy casserole. And it softens hands while you do dishes. Madge, mm. that palm olive liquid of yours, I'm simply in love with it. What, does your husband know about this? Madge. <laughs> <laughs> does your husband know about this, like all the other ones? <laughs> <laughs> These hands, you know, for me it would be like, I wish I were a mortician. I know. <laughs> Well, actually, I started <laughs> laughing the two weeks later because I thought the top of the um, mailbox <laughs> was a was a coffin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got one more. We'll do the last one. Madge, I just got engaged. <laughs> ah, who would ask for this hand? Oh, it's dishwashing. <laughs> What'll I try? Everything. And use palm olive dishwashing liquid. Soften your hands while you do the dishes. You're soaking in it. In dishwashing liquid? Well, it's palm olive. Mild? More than mild. Makes heaps of suds that last. And no kidding. Palm olive softens hands while you do the dishes. Madge, palm olive's great. I'm your fan. Well, thanks, but I've already got a fan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know what that laugh is? It's like those General Foods um, International Here. Coffees commercials. <laughs> Where they talked about the waiter. <laughs> it's all fake. It's so fake. But if you, but Madge has contempt for these women. She is not their friend. She does. She is not their friend. No. <laughs> and I actually them. think there she are... hates them, and she's a serial killer. I swear to God, this is going to show up on a true crime podcast, and they're going to do it in slow motion. So she comes in, and she's like more than mild and then you see the outtake that they didn't put in and it's like ding <laughs> and then you cut away and there's a box of skinny and sweet with the skull and crossbones on it <laughs> see look look she's trying to kill her hand <laughs> back down in <laughs> what have you got in front of you oh you do you do have it. Oh, my God. I thought it was skinny George, and tell sweet. the audience what you brought for show and tell. <laughs> so a couple of years ago, and I didn't know this, but I guess a couple of years ago when they re-released 9 to 5, the, you know, the late, uh, early 80s film, um, they released it as a box set, and the box was an actual box of skinny and sweet. <laughs> so the DVD came in this. So it's the box of Skinny and Sweet from the film, but on the other side is the Ritter Rat. And there's a joke in <laughs> the actual movie about, you know, uh, thinking that the Skinny and Sweet um, or that the Ritter Rat was the actual Skinny. There's, you have to see the film. 
<laughs> yeah, 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 you'd have to be there. <laughs> but yeah, you had to be there. But you know, it looks just it looks the same, except for the, the skull and crossbones. Exactly, except for the little skull and crossbones on the label. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, oh I God, this is so one of my fun. this is one of my favorite things ever, ever. And um, actually, it's like we, I told you, folks, homosexuals are raised on soap operas reruns commercials and the movie nine to five. Oh, uh, yes, yes, yes. Campy films. We could actually, that should be another thing that we actually talk about is obsessions with certain films. <laughs> We're going to, we'll do that on another episode. Uh, and actually I kind of wonder, you know how we have those, um, uh, those monthly zoom hangouts for the show supporters. I thought it might be fun to do one of those, like do a watch party. Oh, I would love that. You know, we, we could watch nine to five or mommy dearest or whatever happened to baby Jane or something like that. Oh my God. I would love that. Absolutely. Good. Yeah. That would be a lot of fun. I love those movies. Right, it doesn't George, matter. I go back to them all the time. It's yeah, fun. I know. I mean, how many times have we seen, I, I must've seen mommy dearest at least three or 400 times. Oh, absolutely. There's, there's no question. And I have to say that, there is nothing like watching the uh, anniversary edition with um, John Waters talking while you're watching the film. It's fantastic. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. It's really good. Well, that's that's the world we live in today, isn't it? I mean, we were talking a little bit before the show. The, one of the ways you could describe the world we're living in right now it is it's quite literally a John Waters movie come to life. We, I have, we've got people. Go on. We've got people who actually. I mean, I'm not. I'm not saying it for a joke. I'm not exaggerating. No. They literally are Edie the Egg Lady, in baby clothes, and they put it on social media. I mean, it. It. And half of these people are like, if Divine didn't think his act was a joke. <laughs> exactly. We are, we are living in in pink flamingos right now. Absolutely. It's, you know, it's funny because, you know, at that time when he was doing those films, like, you know, Mondo Trasho and, and, and each, you know, eat your makeup and even the stuff, you know, that's the early stuff, but even into, you know, the stuff that people know, I mean, there's a reason that he was called, you know, the king of trash and the king of filth and, and things like this, because, yep. you know, I, now that I'm even older, I mean, of course, I look at it through gay sort of campy stuff, but at the same time, it's also, you know, he couldn't make that film now because nobody would think it was funny because it's real. Yeah. Like, that's like, nobody... Nobody saw things like that. You know, he was making fun of like, he was making fun of that stuff. He couldn't do that now because somebody would be like, you know, I can't believe you're making fun of my kink. I like to put eggs on myself and pretend I'm a baby and sit in a baby carriage, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Normalize well, yeah, adult I mean, babies. It, it sort of I mean, puts... It, it puts it out of business. I mean, it, it must be, you know, Trey Parker and Matt Stone must feel like this to some degree sometime. How do they keep making South Park? Because everything, I mean, they're practically profits. You know, shit they were making episodes about 15 years ago is absolutely real today. Yes, absolutely. I'm surprised we don't actually have people getting dolphin confirmation surgery. <laughs> well, well, I mean, well, I mean what's, what's next? I mean, you know it's coming. I mean, and if somebody actually, I mean, there, if somebody said that, there would be a movement to normalize it and affirm it. <laughs> People would come, they would literally come wearing strap on fins to be allies, <laughs> right? Instead of pussy hats, they'd have a fucking fin on. <laughs> They'd be standing outside. They'd be standing. You know how they're. You know how they're all like. Don't don't clap. Use jazz hands. These people would be like. They wouldn't use jazz hands. They all be like. Okay, everybody show appreciation this way. <laughs> <laughs> They'd be like this. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have. Then you have like you know. Then you'd have all of these um, young you know twenty something white 
white women running around with signs going, <laughs> trans dolphins are dolphins, trans dolphins are dolphins. <laughs> Outside of SeaWorld, you know? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Instead of trying to liberate the animals, they'd all be trying to get in the fucking tank. Well, no, that's exactly right. They're like, <laughs> I want to, this is my lived experience. <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous. For more conversation on the dark and disordered psychology that shapes today's cultural and political left, Absolutely. subscribe Thank to our so weekly audio mind. podcast and, on uh, iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Google Absolutely. Podcasts, and virtually anywhere else you get your podcasts. Let's learn to recognize these dynamics and call them what they are. Subscribe to Disaffected to learn how to break the spell. We now have a bonus for our supporters. You can help the Disaffected podcast grow and receive invitations for our off-air Zoom hangouts by becoming a supporting member on Patreon or subscribe star. Patreon users, go to patreon.com slash disaffected. Subscribe star users, you can find us at subscribestar.com slash disaffected. Check out our webpage at disaffected.fm for the complete list of ways you can help support us. And thank you. It's always a pleasure for me to have George on, and I hope you guys enjoyed that too. Uh, and I want to give you a note, both viewers and listeners, because as you know, we do this on video, but we also put it out on audio. So if you haven't already subscribed to us on audio, we're on iTunes, Pandora, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, everywhere you go. Please subscribe to us there, too. There's a slight difference in the segments that you'll hear on the audio with George versus the one that you see on video, because what we did on video, we used so many pictures. We were making fun of ourselves when we were uh, young gay teen boys and in college that we realized that wouldn't carry over on audio. People would have no idea what we were talking about. So we recorded a separate segment of George and I having a discussion just for audio. So if you're a video watcher, Scroll over and listen to our audio for this one. You'll get a little extra content. And same if you are usually an audio listener. And if you want to see a picture of me in a bra and a blonde wig, audio listeners, hop over to YouTube or Odyssey and take a look at the segment. So we're going to close out the show here, but I'm going to leave you uh, with a little gem, something to brighten your week and carry you through until we do this all over again next week. So um, Twitter, naturally. <laughs> I put out a tweet and I, I, yeah, I knew it was going to get some pushback, but I think it needed to be said. Here's what I wrote. I was describing the people who say that because of their personal health concerns that everyone else has to modify their behavior. So in those words, I was illustrating it by saying, I'm immune compromised or I have cancer, so you have to wear your mask. And what I have to say to this is no. You wear yours. You stay home. You segregate yourself. You take precautions. Oh, you weren't expecting somebody to say that out loud, were you? Yeah, I did phrase it provocatively. Because it should not be seen as provocative for people who have immune compromise systems or cancer or whatever it is that makes them vulnerable to take responsibility for protecting themselves. That's what we all did normally two years ago. Really, if you don't remember, really just go back. This idea that because somebody is vulnerable to an illness, that every single other person by decree from the governor has to wear a mask and has to stay away from other people and has to be restricted about going into businesses is ludicrous. This is not a jibe at disabled people. This is just normal. <laughs> so <laughs> I got the usual responses, and I just picked one of my favorites. And this person retweeted and said, Yeah, I wasn't expecting people to be open eugenicists in 2021, but here we are. Eugenicists. I'm a eugenicist for saying that you should be responsible for your own health. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's not even the best part. 
the best part is that this person who called me a eugenicist, I mean, really, honey, I know histrionics, but and I know you can overdo it and you're overdoing it. This is that person. <laughs> this is their Twitter profile, and it is this week's McGender. <laughs> See if I can read this. Um, I ran out of ink on my printer, so I'm having a little bit of trouble with this. This is how this person describes themselves. First of all, anime avatar picture, which is always a red flag. White, 32, gray, pansexual, intersex, they, them, or ath, ather. I guess these are neo-pronouns. Pagan, green witch, theistic, spoony, autistic. <laughs> Go look those things up on your own, because I don't have time to tell you. But that is definitely McGender, and that's the show. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you next week.